Our first reading partnered with Kave Kanam, the nation's most important poetry organization supporting the work of African American writers. Tonight's reading continues our year-long conversation on influences, our MFA program's theme for the year. And I want to say a few words about the reading before we begin. First, could you please turn off any electronic devices, anything that might beep or make noises or flash or um, distract from the reading. So if everyone could just take a minute and turn off their cell phones completely, that would be great. Thank you. Second, I want to thank some people, um, Kave Kanam, the Queens College English Department, the Queens College Foundation for their support that makes this evening possible. This event was funded in part by poets and writers with public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislator. I also want to thank Cypher Books. I want to thank John Rice, our cameraman and MFA program assistant. And I want to thank the staff of this gorgeous museum, the Godwin Turnback Museum, for letting us have our reading in our most favorite space. So tonight's event is called Reading Across Cultures, Poetry, and Conversation. And I'm thrilled that Willie Pordomo and Aime Nezokuma Tatil are here with us tonight. And I'm happy, very happy, that John Murillo is here to moderate a conversation with them on stage after they read. So after the conversation part of the reading, we'll adjourn to the lobby where we'll have a reception and books will be for sale and you can get the poets to sign their books. So to conclude, I'd like to introduce Nicole Seeley the other Nicole, who will introduce <laughs> the readers tonight. Nicole Seeley is the Programs Director at Kaveh Kanem. She is most recently the winner of the fabulous 2014 Stanley Kunitz Memorial Prize from the American Poetry Review. Her work has appeared in Best New Poets 2011, Callaloo, Harvard Review, Plowshares, Third Coast, and elsewhere. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. As you already know, Kaveh Kanem is a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of African American poets. Since 1996, Kaveh Kanem has been a home for black poetry across the country. You can learn more about Kaveh Kanem, what we're up to, and ways to support by visiting our website, kavehkanempoets.org. Please check out our table, as Nicole mentioned, where you can buy books and sign up to be on our mailing list. I'd like to thank our generous host, Queens College, especially Nicole Cooley and Kamiko Hahn. Thanks also to our funders, Mrs. Giles Whiting Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and of course, all of you for coming out tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Willie Perdomo and Amy Nezokumatato. Amy Nez is the author of three collections of poetry, most recently, Lucky Fish, she co-authored a chapbook of nature poems, Lace and Pyrite, with the poet Ross Gay, and has received many awards for her writing, including a Pushcart Prize and an NEA Fellowship in Poetry. She is a professor of English at SUNY Fredonia. Willie Perdomo is the author of The Essential Hits of Shorty Bonbon, bon, Where a Nickel Costs a Dime, and Smoking Lovely, winner of the Penn Beyond Margins Award. His poems have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Bomb, Mandorla, and African Voices. He is a former recipient of the Woolrich Fellowship in Creative Writing at Columbia University and two-time New York Foundation for the, for the Arts Poetry Fellow. He is a Bona Voices faculty member, a 2015 Kaveh Kanem faculty member, and an instructor of English at Phillips Exeter Academy. Amy and Willie will each read their work Following their readings, John Murillo, author of Up Jump the Boogie and recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, will moderate a conversation between them. Please welcome Amy Nez, who will be followed by Willie Perdomo. Um, I'm gonna start off um, with kind of an older one for my first book and then I'll finish with um, some new ones. My mother is a, a psychiatrist, so I wanted to mention that I grew up with a kind of a scientific background, um, and this was, we had no literature in our house at all, um, and this was kind of part of the process of growing up um, where I didn't know what was actually from my mother's um, just fanciful mind or was actually 
true. Um, and this one is called Hell Pig. To keep me from staying out late at night, my mother warned of the hell pig. Black and full of hot drool, eyes the color of a lung, it would follow me home if I stayed past my curfew. How could I tell my friends to press pause in the middle of a video, say their goodbyes while I shuffled up the stairs and into my father's waiting blue car? How could I explain this to my dates and whisper why we could not finish the dance? It's not like the pig had any special powers or could take a tiny bite from my leg, only the assurances it was simply scandal to be followed home. When my date and I pull into my driveway and dim the lights, we take care to make all the small noises that get made in times like these even smaller. Squeaks in the seats, a slow spin of the radio dial, and the silver click of my belt. Too late. A single black hair flickers awake the ear of the dark animal waiting for me at the end of the sidewalk. My fumbling of keys and various straps becomes a wild dance to the door. There is the hell pig grunting in tune to each hurried step, each of his wet breaths puffing into tiny clouds, a small storm brewing. My favorite lake in India, um, where my father's from in South India, um, is called Uti Lake. Um, and I like um, just spelling it out because it's, um, it's like booty without the B. So it's <laughs> O-O-T-Y. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Uti Lake. The man yells out of agony and smacks the beast's back leg. My saddle is oily and fringed with tassel. All around us is a gurgle of magpie, insect, and lake. Black monkeys zip through the elephant's legs as we rumble ahead, and I lean over to shoo them from their game. There sits a tiger with toes spread into the shoreline, one tooth curling over his lip like a joke no one forgets. In eighth grade, I asked a boy to dance who said, I'm not feeling that wild right now. And would I consider another, another boy, another song? I did not ask. All night I sipped cola with Sarah, and I wondered when and where I'd find a wild one who dances, who sings, who sees all the reds of a jungle. This is in two parts. Um, these are, it's a double homage to grief and happiness. So this is part one, the homage to grief. I believe in the tears of an elephant, how they stamp the ground and forget they are in musk, panting, and cinnamon shrubs or piles of sugar cane can't tempt them to stop their cycle of grief. I believe in the broken heart of an elephant. When a companion dies, I believe in the rocking back and forth, the dry, pebbly tongue. I believe in wanting to wear only dust, hear only dust, and taste only dust. I believe in wanting to touch nothing, and wanting nothing to touch you. Two, the homage to happiness. I believe in the tail wag of a dog. The toothy grin of an apple-fed horse and the shine from the wet in their eyes, wild with joy. I like the movements in a chimp's fine fur as he swings from branch to rubber tire and thumps his companion on the head with a bright red ball. I believe in the single sugar cube sparkling on a small ceramic dish as we sit at a cafe, me sipping a soda with paper straw, you leaning in close to point to something that neither of us have ever tried but we will today. The waiter will say, good, good choice, my favorite, as he gathers up the vinyl menus and leaves us. This is a place uh, in India, it's, um, it's in North India, and it is um, one of the biggest marketplaces one of the biggest marketplaces um, for costume jewelry. So my grandmother made sure I visited there when I was um, when I last visited her, and it's called the Lad Bazaar. This is the place to be if you want bangles. A man with five long green parrotlets 
perched on his shoulders and a pink one on his head, hisses for you to step closer to his cart. If you buy ten silver bangles inlaid with luck, he'll give you a bird for free. Five bangles will get you a free bag of mangoes, and a few stalls down, a woman with a baby on her breast will tell you of the ones you can't purchase anywhere else on this planet. The slim gold and silver bangles made of hollow glass. A single sneeze can send them shooting six feet into the air. A laugh could blow them clear across a pineapple plantation. Each bangle variety has a name like Genitary Galimane, which means living in your streets. At the other end of, your spe of the spectrum, Shishansha Kada, or the king of bangles. The ones I want lay somewhere in the middle, the kind to match the beads my grandmother holds as she prays to live long enough to meet my sons, and the kind that bring a rain of tiny lantana flowers on the sandals I accidentally leave on the steps overnight. I want the bangles that clink like a goat laughing in her sleep. Um, I give this assignment um, right about this time, actually, of the semester to my students, just to kind of write about the worst job you ever had. Um, and while they're writing, I write along with them. And this uh, came out of that exercise, actually. And so uh, you're looking at a former um, Clinique girl. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the white lab coat. There's no, I was not a doctor of makeup at all. Like, they give you like a, a binder, a three ring binder to memorize, and then a white lab coat. And then poof, you're given, you're supposed to give makeovers to people. So I think there was a DVD or actually a VHS I was supposed to watch, and then I never watched it. So this is Song of the Ex Cosmetics Counter Gal. I was thirsty when I worked at a department store during winter break in college, applying mascara and gloss on complete strangers. It was the season of drunk, delicious holiday parties and too many sequins. Everyone wanted to learn how to look a little bit less like a paint-by-numbers version of themselves. I grew to hate the mouth and all its various bows and spittle, so I quit. I thought my perfect love would be a gumball, super sweet. It leaves a bright tint on your tongue so everyone knows you've just had one. All the color you need, if you ask me, lasts long enough until you tire. And for change, you could always get another and another. Um, this was a poem um, about well, no, I never know what my poems are about, but um, the image that I started with was the first and only time I've ever held the gun. Um, and those that know me know that that is a very dangerous thing. I have no knowledge of any firearms whatsoever. So, the two times I loved you most on a farm. It was your idea to teach me how to sleep under the stars, how to hold a gun, how to shoot it in the air and firework it across the setting sun. A silver dragonfly with a singular purpose, to hunt and snap its mouth around the sweetest bee and pluck it right out of the air. I didn't know love could be so loud. And once the fields of soybean and mice became a kind of prayer, shushing tassel, tassels on the blown back calico curtains of your childhood bedroom, where you kissed me, my shoulders, before the window. I never saw the ribs of a silver silo that way again. I'm so glad um, Rigo is in the audience, Rigoberto Gonzalez. Uh, I'm going to put him on the spot here. He turned me on to um, some of Anne Sexton's poems that I never knew. Um, you know, we always hear of her kind, her kind, and then that's kind of it. But she has this great. Um, kind of section of poems called Bestiary USA, and I was just bedazzled. I never even told you about this, but I was bedazzled by all of these um, poems uh, about, they're almost like curses to different animals, kind of animals of the earth. And there's one that's very scathing, of course, in Anne Sexton's style, where she kind of curses the cockroach. And my poem is a response to that, and this is The Cockroach Responds. <laughs> And there's a little epigraph from Anne Sexton. 
When I turn the light on, you scuttle into the corners, and there is this hiss upon the land. But of course, you didn't stick around for the bloom of babies. And whatever evil I was given, I swallowed, which is more than I can say for some women. It became a beautiful swell in my side, and when my body could not bear it, I stood on my head and offered myself up to the lavender lining of the clouds. The world and all I knew could be good again. I have another chance. My young will learn to land safe, even though they can never sprout wings. I'll teach them the fine trick of walking up jelly-smeared aquarium glass. You can bet my babies will always remember to watch out for sticky tongue and beak. I mentioned my mother as a psychiatrist, um, and I wanted to read a selection, um, kind of it stemmed off on an exercise that Patricia Smith gave me, um, to write about the most difficult year of your adolescence, and I wanted to say, like, all of them were, right? Like, all of them. But the one that was most exquisitely painful for me um, is when my family moved. So, as a psychiatrist, we had to move from state hospital to state hospital to state hospital, and we lived on the grounds of most of them. Um, and at 12 years old, that was difficult to kind of reconcile. So this is simply called 12, 12, 12, and it's in 12 little sections. Um, and I like to think of them as just kind of mosaics, because there's no way I could fit this into a narrative. A, when I was 12, I lived on the grounds of a mental asylum, period. B, that meant we lived in the doctor's quarters, one of the three big brick houses that edged the institute. See, my younger sister and I practiced her keys, our favorite cheerleading jumps off the ble patient's bleachers near the softball field. D, when I was 12, I aced the experiments with celery and food coloring. They let me skip a whole grade and get right to the dissections. E, I secretly wished my supply of grape bubble yum would never run out, but I couldn't figure out how to blow bubbles and snap the lavender gum like Sarah could. Hmm. F. We sold gift wrap and crystals for a junior high fundraiser, and my mom still asks, where are all the crystals I bought, and why don't you display them in your house? <laughs> G. When I was 12, I learned about the darkening hairs on my legs. My mother brought me, bought me my first training bra, no cup, just little triangle pieces stitched together, and then a slice of New York-style cheesecake to bring home. H, home. I, when I was 12, our house always smelled of fried lumpia or ginger. J, we had zinnias as wide as my outstretched hand nodding at us in our garden. K, my school had to create a whole new bus stop just for my sister and me, and everyone stopped talking and stared when we climbed onto the bus each morning, <laughs> smelling of grape gum and ginger roots. L, just who are these girls? And just two more here. Um, I learned how to play the game of chess very late um, in life, like last year. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I was just taken, you know, as most poets are, with the um, vocabulary of chess. Castling, rooks, decoys, things like that. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of just the jumping off point, the trigger for this poem. Chess. Exactly four different men have tried to teach me how to play. I never could tell the difference between a rook or a bishop, but I knew the horse meant knight. And that made sense to me, because a horse is knight. Soot hoof and nostril, dark as a sable the evening with no stars, bats, or moon blooms. It's a night in Ohio where a man sleeps alone one week, and the next, the woman he will eventually marry leans her body into his for the first time. Leans a kind of faith, too, filled with white crickets and bouquets of wild carrot. And the months and the honeyed years after that will make all the light and dark squares feel like tiles for a kitchen they can one day build together. 
Every turn, every sacrificial move, all the decoys, the castling, the deflections, these will be both riotous and tumbly, unruly, the exact opposite of what she thought she ever wanted in the end game of her days. And the last one I'll read is from Lucky Fish. Um, and it's, uh, I go through, I actually just uh, saw Willie earlier this week. Uh, I was a guest at Exeter Academy. And I would say the number one question I get when I go and visit high schools is the, um, the title of this poem here. So this is kind of my response to that. It's nothing about my poems itself, um, craft or you know poetics, anything like that. It's, are the, all the breakups in your poems real? <laughs> If by real, you mean as real as a shark tooth stuck in your heel, the wetness of a finished lollipop stick, the surprise of a thumbtack in your purse, then yes, every last bit is true, every page, every nuance and bite. Wait, I have made them up, all of them, and when I say I am married, it means I married all of them, a whole neighborhood of past loves. Can you, marry, can you imagine the number of bouquets and how many slices of cake? Even now, my husband's plan a great meal for us. One chops up some parsley, one stirs a bubbling pot on the stove. One changes the baby, one sleeps in a fat chair. One flips through the newspaper, and another whistles while he shaves in the shower. And every single one of them wonders when I am finally coming home. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a few shout outs uh, I definitely have before uh, I get started. Um, I, I, I want to thank uh, Nicole Seely at Kaveh Khanum and definitely the Kaveh Khanum Foundation. Uh, I remember Nicole was a student in a regional class that I taught at Poets House so many, so many, so many years ago. And so it's good to see you doing your thing and thank you for the invite. Um, Nicole uh, Cooley at Queens, the CUNY at the MFA program, thank you. And Kamiko Han, I, I think, I've known Kamiko Han since I was what they used to call a young poet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's great to see her uh, here. Um, John Murillo who I had the pleasure of, of, of publishing his first collection of, of poems called Up Jump the Boogie. And uh, it, was, it was really John that kind of me, gave me the, the, the impetus to, to, to start, I think, start writing again. Um, I can say that after I read his book, Tahimba, I was looking for another poet to publish, and Tahimba Jess said, I have just a person for you. And uh, we met during an AWP in, in Chicago. And I said, well, send me the poems. And, he sent me at least 10 of them, and right away we knew this is the book that we needed to do, so I'm glad that you're doing this Q&A with us as well. Uh, Roberto's in the house, good to see you, as always. Joseph, uh, uh, Maza, how are you? Uh, <laughs> uh, and then all the MFA students, man, thank you for coming, because, yo, this is, this is far out here, this Queens uh, College. <laughs> and, uh, I was walking up here, but I knew I had to be on the fourth floor, but it felt like I was on the first floor when I walked in, so I didn't, I didn't I really know where I, where I was. I hardly get out the queen, so thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so, um, one of the things that I did when I wrote this, uh, the, this, this most recent book called The Essential Hits of Shorty Bong Bong, and most people will say The Essential Hits of Shorty Bong Bong, and I left the accent off the O on purpose, but it's called The Essential Hits of Shorty Bong Bong, and Shorty Bong Bong was uh, one of the original founders of the New York and Poets Cafe. Uh, uh, there's about eight of them, or well, nine of them. There's a whole list of them, really. Uh, this book has nothing to do really with him, but I did use the name <laughs> as uh, I, I used the name as a tribute to the New York and Poets Cafe and all the founders of the New York and Poets Cafe. And it, it's a very percussive name, too. It's a, a book about a musician, so I thought it was perfect. Um, so one of the things that I did, uh, I just started reading poems about music, uh, musicians. Um, figures in music, themes in music. Uh, and Kevin Young had a couple of uh, Everyman Library, these pocket editions of, of books that uh, revolved around music. One of them, I think, was jazz poems, and then another, another one was called blues poems. And I have a copy of it. Um, and what, while I was looking through it, it was the first time I found it, I actually had a poem in there. I was like, damn, I have a poem in this book, and I didn't know, right? So that was cool. But the bonus was, the bonus was that my mentor, I was a CUNY student myself at City College of New York, yeah. uh, and, and, and the, 
late 80s, early 90s, and my professor and mentor, uh, who's no longer there, he's deceased, his name was Raymond R. Patterson. Uh, he, was, uh, he was known for a poem called, uh, in a chapter called 26 Ways of Looking at a Black Man. So Raymond was my mentor, and he has a poem in here as well. So I'm going to read the poem I have in here, and then I'm, I'm going to read Raymond's, and I'm going to the book. And this was an indication for me that I was writing about music as, as soon as my first collection came out, because Langston Hughes was a big influence, and Langston Hughes used to like to hang out in bars in Harlem, overhear conversations. And while these conversations were playing, I'm sure the jukebox was playing at the same time. Uh, so Langston imprint is all over this poem, and you'll see it's called Song for Langston, 171. And it's almost as if I think Langston probably kind of visited me that night and probably wrote the poem himself. <laughs> Song for Langston. I sang all night and cried all day. Been waiting for a storm to come my way. Drown the tears, make soft the pain. I hope my prayers are not in vain. And talking about pain, this is Special Pain Blues by Raymond R. Patterson. Anybody can shout and holler. It takes a special pain to sing the blues. I say anybody can moan and holler, but a special pain brings the blues. It ain't about losing your last dollar or having holes in both your shoes. Children cry when they lose their candy. Babies cry when they wet themselves. Young folks cry anytime it's handy. Blues come up from deeper wells. Takes a natural woman to draw that muddy water up. <laughs> Takes a natural man to cart that bucket home and let you drink from the broken cup and ease the thirst that's in your bone. Thirsty to the bone. Sometimes the blues so cold it cracks the jar it's in. Sometimes it's scalding hot and burns right through the skin. Stand it up beside my rainy if you want the test. Anything less than folks that folks try to sing ain't the real thing. That's why Raven R. Pappas. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book about my uncle, and uh, Amy was talking about triggers uh, that kind of begin either poems and sometimes collections. And the trigger for this collection was a memory of my uncle who played with uh, some Saisa bands back in the 1970s, namely the Sesta All-Stars in 1975-1976, and his name was Pedro Perdomo. And I was in my first year, I was in a long poem workshop with Lewis Warsh. And there was a poet in my workshop. I was a student actually at LIU. Oh, and my boy uh, uh, Uche and Duke is in the house as well. I'm not sure, but he was one of my classmates. And he teaches here as well. Um, I was in this long poem workshop and someone tried, said, we should start writing about music. And as soon as she said that, the lines, um, all I can remember between first and last track is how I replied to those voice sweet pretty boys came out of my pen. And right away I knew that that wasn't me, it was like my uncle, uh, it was like a visitation. And I knew that and I didn't get in the way at all uh, of his visitation. Uh, so the book is called The Essential Hits of Shorty Bong Bong. It's split up into four sections. Uh, the first section deals with, with his apprenticeship. The second section deals with this um, the love of his life, a singer named Rose. And of course, she had to be Rose because she's from Spanish Harlem, right? So, <laughs> and then a visit to Puerto Rico that turns out to be extremely surreal. And then the last section of the book is kind of an elegy where all the poets try to combine in on Shorty's exit. Um, so I'll read two poems from the first section. Just to give you an indication, I'll read a poem from the Rose section, and then I'll, I'll, I'll fade out with the, with the elegy at the very, very end. Syncopated licks. 
begin and end with a syncopated lick, first with your right, then back again with your left. To be real, I had masters back against the wall, thirsty for loops, cinder block fingertips, piss treated calluses, skin loud and stacked with sewn. The jump was so jumping that my red bandana pin dropped and buckled like a leaf falling new, lobes tickling happy, a crispy voice custom made by storm. I'm waxed down to a tight bounce. You laid me out in the sun to cure. Open up, make room for your devil. Go hard hands. Dig fire out of me. Man, I mean Gallup phrase to bar, flew from zero to Mars and blasts and blips, poet, but never so high that I couldn't fall again. So then the poet tries to step in with this poem called The Birth of Shorty Bom Bom, and he tries to write it seven different times. This is take number three. The Ciceros, the real life soneros, the palo players that gang busted dance halls with fish crepe yambu, the tumberos who recorded the earth in clay jugs, who steel beam shoulders held up skies until shingling floors were occupied by the perfect fourth of democracy, the quintets that crashed baptisms and plucked concert hall from park bench and band shell, who glittered airwaves without commission, who changed their names from Joe Loco to Joe Panama, Joe Ponce to Joe Cuba, who Caskilled, then Corso, who vamped it up and whistled evil out of garden. The Africando was so hot, co-op boards had to call the police. This take is for the Cocolos who carried a nation on their crazy, on their cool. What you can say about Shorty Bong Bong is that he never, never crossed the clave. He knew it was all dirt at the end. Then we go into the section with Rose, it's called To Be With You. And Rose steps in to kind of give her own take. Shorty and Rose kind of have this uh, back and forth. And I'll just read one poem called Dear Shorty, number four, and she too tries to write the same piece seven different times. Dear Shorty, number four. And if you saw me falling, what would you yell from the great street? What is all this shit you talk about when you talk about love? This zoo band, this fun house could be swing, could be slide. This ball, this diesel, what is this thing you call pure and sickness? Tell me, tell me, if you feature or go first what good is reason to the last set? When you read the stains at the bottom of my coffee cup, be careful. You might feel more like a monster than a tree, and what looks like a monster is really a tree. If I had a license, you might say true. You might say that all the beautiful discoveries usually come late to the party. And so I'll go right into the last section. And the last section is called The Birth of Shorty Bong Bong Solo. So Shorty kind of takes over the poem. Uh, and there's an epigram at each uh, section. Uh, it's a quote because it's kind of an interview structure almost. And it's Shorty saying, they say each saint will have its day. I say, give that bone to another dog. <laughs> the Birth of Shorty Bong Bong, take number six. This is the poet. Tellers always ask if that will be all. Told always says, I didn't hear you. Hey man, don't nobody want to read your dedication? Can you feel me in the back by the bling and the blab? Can you fade this, brother? Everything is leaving now. The plan for today is, are you two? Are you one? 
Are you forever? How much is that money in the window? You are new today, son. Feliz, feliz a tu muerte. Side A, 3-2. This is short. And the poet, they're all gonna try to get in. You switch to a velvet booth, a short-circuited tombstone solo wears a cosmopolitan smirk. Who is that cop in please talking about they haven't played that tune in a while? Today is heavy-footed, branch dumb, old standards grill the last call, and outside the skylines, the skylines are consumed by one, two, one, two, three. Time to dig historic in that section of the circle where high call answers question with song. Yes, poet, I heard you. And then what happened to Shorty Bong Bong? He gave his last breath to Viejo San Juan. Is it true what they say about Shorty Bong Bong? No bird sells his wings, no sonero his song. Oh, read me those poems about Shorty Bong Bong. He buried his drummer in La Plaza Colón. Oh, tell me what happened to Shorty Bong Bong. He lost his Junjun in Viejo San Juan. You lived on dreams and pauses for a whole take. Whenever prayer shocked your fate lines, Buddha sang for pennies and his song blubbered the heavens. The heavens went quiet with his laugh. The rocks in your path were unemployed and there was enough space for a second life. Sounds like just as it is, only way out was to be about something. You, fly guy with the hard hands, blade swimmer, don't know if you heard, but this horse is ready. Gather your clouds and pearls. Here comes lightning. Put on grease and butter, eagle coat, glass slipper, bitch mink, evil face, guitar whale, oh bongo, oh agogo, kundalini, and caduceus, clack clack, oh yeah, como va, check my bong bong, something nasty. <laughs> it is true. Since birth, your ears have been close to the curb for every initiation, a costly exit. Recall the way bodies rock, heads nodded, summers were fertile for fib, stacked upon fib. A platoon of funerals and shipwrecks marched to pure end, wreaking spleen to spine havoc. Still, you scrape dead skin off your fingertips. All those hot beats, and not one to go home with. You, Tom the Fence and Mesmerize Sin, sneak attack and crossfire. Oh no, voice, you dead flower. Before you go, grab my cowbell, my clave can divide by three and conquer by twilight. Oh clave, go, combust bleachers, warrior call, thug trish you hang from my neck and party all night long. Side B, two, three. A stone skip away from my last wish to die clean, no stains left. The heroic jam has been my lifelong business. My arc of bones lay square inside the one and two. Burning stairs call, time to go, y'all. The great street is now playing me. Prince of Catch Me If You Can, still trying to outrun the moon to hear you tell it. Come the great street, he'll have to scrape you off the corner with the rest of the outlaws. I tricked out bombs and slung bricks, no mirror to be found. The angels rocked inferno stances, greedy chased greedy. Night was dressed in flight and snow told more tales than a dead man in a new world. To hear you tell it. When he comes wolf packing around the corner, Jesus Christ can be on backup, but he better know going in that even Jesus Christ can get his jaw broken. <laughs> the price for my sonata non grata was all good. Timber yoked in mudslides. Toca, 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 toma, 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 toma. The great street offered to buy me. No exchanges, he said. Baya, baya, baya. Baya, juega, 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 juega. Didn't drop the secret then. No use dropping it now. The real never matches the display. Even when you try it one dream at a time, not looking kills you just as looking might. Last chance to rewind, to pick up more than what's left. 
And what you find funny is that nothing's funny between future and fury. What pulls you is here to stay. Rose, butter knife, that's your microphone. Tony, fork and frying pan, you on cowbell. Pablo, dry red beans in the baby bottle. Maracas, flaco, the pencils in the kitchen drawer. Clave, me, I'll get the empty garbage can. And Ray, bang on the wall until the horses come. The bulb in my bicephalous heart dimmed down on Rose's soft glare. No words. No air. The birth of Shorty Boom Boom final take. Drum, the ground in the zero. Drum, the quake in the earth. Drum, the one in the two. Drum, the death in the birth. Drum, the hang in the kankan. Drum, the bomb in the bomba. Drum, the cha and the cha cha. Drum, the humba humbiao. Drum, the tumba tumbao. Drum, the dang in the ding. Drum, the pop in the smooth. Drum, the cry and the croon. Drum, the black in the hole. Drum, the sand in the time. Drum, the bend in the pitch. Drum, the reason the rhyme. Drum, the sugar the trade. Drum, the slap in the silly. Drum, the song in the belly. Drum, the moose in the call. Drum, glissando. Drum, glissando. Drum, you. Thank you. Inside the actor studio, James with some questions to ask. You know, kind of fill some time. And also, I invite you guys to ask each other questions as well. Yeah? All right. Can we ask you a question? Can you ask me a question? Yes. Um, yeah, I'll defer them. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually going to go sit on the edge over there. And I'll get some. How you guys feeling? Uh, yeah. Well, it's weird having people like standing over you and hanging out in your phone. I feel like I should be dancing on the script pole. Right? <laughs> it's like the Apollo. Yeah. All right, so um, this evening is not at all about me, but I'm going to make it about me for about two minutes. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? So Willie um, mentioned how in Chicago, he was a friend of mine who walked down the street, and that's how we discovered each other, right? That was in uh, 2008. Like three months earlier, I met Amy. We ran together at Columbia in College. About a month after that, Kamiko came out, and I introduced Kamiko, right? <laughs> Now, so I'm kind of making a stretch here. So I leave Chicago, I come to New York, and I went to a concert at which I was supposed to meet Nicole Seeley, but she didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> but we did eventually meet, and we're getting married this Saturday. <laughs> Um, because every time I hear that, and I know it's not you asking the question, 
question down, but for the other people, I'm just always thinking like you're not loving enough, you're not um, eating enough, you're not um, just enjoying life enough. If you're really, and you're not writing enough, if you are asking these questions, you know what I mean? Um, it's like, does music matter? Does art matter? Does breathing matter? Does sex matter? All this, all these things that just drives me bonkers. But what I can say that poetry matters in that it fills in the spaces and the places that narrative doesn't, where narrative doesn't suffice. So for example, I can just say, just off the top of my head, um, that poem 12, I kind of smiled about it saying, ah, oh, 12 years old was a difficult time for me. There's no way, at least, there's no way right now that I can write a narrative of like, my memoir of my 12, you know, when I was 12 years old. But in poetry, I can find this kind of fractured lyric where I can make sense only after I compose it, not during it, but start to make sense of um, putting together the pieces of a mosaic so that in, when you look at the page, and I'm counting the white space as well, the white space is just as important for having that kind of breath and that silence and having those pauses and reflection as well, as well as savoring the images and the sensory detail of the ginger and the bubble gum. Um, and things like that. For me, that's what a poem can do um, in ways that you can't, uh, I don't think, get that in a movie or in a novel or things like that, where it's, it's, it's purposeful, at least the way I was writing, it's purposeful to have these kind of fractured silences. So, um, and I think that's necessary. I don't want us to be in this world where we're so plugged in and walking down the street and we can't notice things because we're always listening. And I think that pause and that silence necessary too. So that's kind of a big answer, but... Um, yeah, no, I'll just jump off Amy and like in terms of the list of questions that she had, like, you know, does poetry music, uh, does music matter? Yes. Does sex matter? Yes. Does uh, food matter? Yes. Like, yes to all of it, right? Uh, I think for poetry specifically, uh, what it allowed me to do with this recent collection was talk to my uncle. And uh, it was no other way that I could have because I had never met my uncle. So poetry was that portal that allowed me to communicate with someone who I did not know. Um, I've been talking a lot with my students about what Toni Morrison calls the white gaze. Mm. You guys know this, this idea of writing under the white gaze where um, writers of color assume a white reader. Right? Um, and in the writing, you have to explain things they wouldn't have to explain when they're writing for someone who is uh, they resemble themselves. Um, there's this poem in your book, uh, Dear Betty Brown, where you take the Texas State Representative to the task for suggesting that Asian Americans um, uh, choose names for themselves that are uh, more understandable to English speakers. Mm -hmm. And then this poem starts with the lines, if I didn't change my name for my husband, I'm certainly not going to change it for you. <laughs> <laughs> which unbeknownst to me at the time, um, my future husband lived an hour away from me, um, but I didn't know that at the time, and it was always, it was still quite such a sample, because um, I know here today I spent a glorious afternoon just seeing such a rainbow of people, it was so awesome, I'm just not used to that in Western New York, um, but just to give you a snippet of an example, you know, anytime in high school when, like we talk about the Vietnam War, um, and again, I'm, I'm, my mother's Filipino, my father's from India. They'd be like, and Amy, what do you think of the, v of the Vietnam people? Or, you know, like as I was the spokesperson for all of Asia, you know, something like that. Um, and so I think, yeah, there was a period where um, I was explaining everything from my last name to food that my parents cooked when friends came over. Um, and I just... I'm kind of over it, you know, in some ways. And I think, and I think with organizations like Javier Khanum and Kudiman and um, Lanchas Latinas, I think it's, I'm, I get so inspired when I see um, members' books where there's no translation of um, certain words. And I'm like, yes, that's so great because I know, and, and even in, in my, um, I guess I need my second 
reflection. I have notes or a glossary, and I understand that that's totally, that's helpful in some ways, but I also think that we're in a different time now in 2014, that there's a lot to be gained from hearing the word itself and not having it spelled out for you or footnoted or having an index in the back. And, so, and it's not to say that I don't care about the, the reader if they don't understand me, because I do, very much so. And when you talk about um, ideal audience, I think of my um, younger sister who is a pediatric nurse, and I think the last, I think she's the last um, poetry book she read was one that I like forced her to read just for something, and it was a Billy Collins book, and I love Billy Collins, I don't want to rip on it, but that's the last, usually it's Harry Potter, Billy Collins is about it. <laughs> so she's my ideal audience because she has no qualms about calling me out like, Amy, I don't understand at all what you're talking about here, or your, your diction is too lofty, or what are you talking about, you know, basically what are you talking about. Yeah. So I do care what people, you know, basic comp comprehension, but I also don't care to spell out every right, last right. you know, so. And with this latest book, Shoki Bon Bon, um, it's a departure from your two previous collections, right? The poem's more compressed. Um, there's a lot uh, less spelled out, not that the first books were um, any more accessible, but uh, there's something, you're trusting your reader more in this book, I feel like. Do you, when you were composing this book, did you ever have any um, misgivings or thoughts that the people who were writing with you for all these years, for your first two collections, might not be there, or did you say, trust the reader enough that they'll come with you? No, I was ready to give them all up. I, you know, I, you know, <laughs> seriously, I think, you know, you have to be in that position. I mean, if you spend enough time in front of an audience reading poems out loud for specific numbers of years, what happens is that you'll always be thinking about that audience when you go up there and read those poems, right? You'll always go be thinking about that audience when you go actually write the poems as well. So one of the things that I think that was different this time around was that, that I stopped thinking about it. Yeah. that audience out there. I stopped thinking about the audience is always clapping after every poem. I stopped thinking about um, the audience that may have followed you through those first two books. And um, it was almost like creative writing one on one. Like, you know, stop thinking about your audience for now, right? right. And then, you know, uh, take it from there. Yeah. So I think it's something that you almost have to sacrifice without being arrogant about it, you know, because I think your audience definitely sustains you, um, but you have to be willing to take a risk in losing that particular audience uh, by ranging out in terms of using a lyric of trying to talk to ghosts, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I had no qualms about it um, when I started writing the book, and it was the most free I think I've ever felt uh, writing and there are some people who will get with it, and there are some people who will be like, yo, you got to go back to my little right, right, poem. Right, right. And like, I right, this, yeah, when I'm ready, yeah. it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm ready, it'll happen. But right now, I'm just talking to my, uh, my uncle, yeah. and I'm just trying to squeeze some, some love in there at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so your first book about 1996. It did. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and yours is 2003. That's right. Um, what's changed uh, between then and now, uh, personally, as a writer, as far as the literary landscape as you see it? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, um, so, the changes in terms of the literary landscape, like how many things you talk about? I mean, just like for you, like, how do you enter the world as a, as a poet, as the author Shorty Mongong versus Willie Perdomo in 1996? Oh, uh, grown up, more mature, I think. Um, open, um, somewhat mediated, I think. Um, By mediated, you mean? Meaning that. I could have used a few good readers the first time, two times around. You know, I, I could have used those, like, some good readers. I think the first time around. And, uh, not to take anything away from the passion that the books were written with, uh, but I think it's growth, life experience, and then like the reading. I, I forgot how much I love to read as well, and that became. I started reading the way people listen to music. They start.
start, you know, like you love singers, right? And you go to those singers, and you love, you know, musicians, mm -hmm. and you go to the musicians, singing the poets. So I started reading Pleasure, mm -hmm. and that I think that pleasure started making its way into uh, the writing process. Where before I, I think I always had that audience kind of in the back of my mind mm -hmm. while I was writing, yeah. and then personally. Oh man, there's all kinds of things happening in your life. You know, you get married, you have kids, you move to New England, and, and, and you know, how the hell did this happen? You know, you have you know, cappuccino on Main Street somewhere. Like, all right. You know, so that definitely makes its way in terms. I think it definitely makes its way into into your work. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm less, I think I'm less lonesome now as a writer, and I think when I come to the page, I'm still always lonely, and I think that's a good place to be. Um, but I think there's this thing called the internet, which was just kind of, you know, um, I mean, it was around in 2003, but that really, gosh, I'm thinking of my, my first book, that's how I, I first kind of connected with, I mean, through grad school, through undergrad, again, I was like the only Asian American, so, um, and my teachers, they didn't, they didn't really know where to kind of show me, you know, to go. I mean, so I was reading, um, basically I had this, I don't know if you guys know, there's a anthology, I don't know if it's still in print, maybe it is, um, Al Poulin, it would be called the Poulin Anthology of Poetry. So that was my poetry bible, and anybody brown or anybody that looked a little different was my kind of guru. So that's Rita Dove, Gwendolyn Brooks, Yusuf Kuminyaka. Anybody who, I mean, I depended on that Poland anthology so, so much. Um, so, and I, would, and I wouldn't dream of, you know, kind of like looking them, I mean, I wouldn't even consider emailing them, you know, now, or then. Um, but I've been so pleased that through the internet, through email, um, there's been a community of writers where I find my own people. I mean, I think I first heard the names um, Sarah Gambito, Oliver De La Paz, through the internet, this Patrick Rizal, somewhere in New Jersey, you know, things like that. These were poets who were, again, like singular at the time, and we first kind of made our connections on the internet. So, um, and now, and I still live in a fairly rural place, um, and so my readers are also kind of on the internet. I don't get to have the kind of cappuccino and a writer's group thing, but I'll say, uh, you know, Ross, can you look at this poem for me? And vice versa, and I'll send it back. Um, and so that has been helpful as well. Um, and, you know, when, I mean, so I think just community, and for better or worse, social media is, is kind of, I think, a huge part in terms of um, getting, I mean, I remember, gosh, and maybe really you were like this too. Um, I would cold call. I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about publicity or any, I mean, there's no, Publicity and poets it just did not really go together. So I cold call in a white pages in San Francisco, these library, or libraries and um, bookstores. I have no connections. I mean, there's no such thing as I didn't have. Um, and just, hi, my name is Amy. Um, can I do a poetry reading anytime you would like? I'm going to die. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So, um, <laughs> I don't know where we are. How are we? It's about seven fifty. Seven fifty. Okay. All right. So um, I'm gonna read some of these questions. Okay. All right. Short answers. Short, short answers. answers. All right. Or short <laughs> questions rather. Absolutely. All right, so this one. Let's see. Once you have an idea, how do you develop a poem? All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll read that question again. Um, once you have an idea, how do you develop a poem? Um, I never have ideas. It's, I have images. 
So I have an image first, like I said, the, first, the easiest way to get me to stop writing is to say, I will write a nature poem now, or something like that. So if I have an idea that's actually bad for me. Uh -huh. But if I am triggered by an image or a sound, um, or just try to recreate a sensory detail, that's kind of what starts it for me. And then I just kind of do a free write from there, really. It's, this, it's the same old, same old technique that I've been doing for, for, you know, for years and years now. But, um, and it's only in the revision process that I start to tease out, oh, I'm seeing this is now um, a statement on the environmental situation, you know, things like that. But I never, I never have started, started with that at all. So it'll be, and I, and I, um, I have young kids now too, so I'd be lying if I said, oh, I write every day at four in the morning. But I do always keep very, a fairly, um, you know, I always dip into what I have, it's called an image journal, um, and so just little snippets of things, so that later when I do have that precious two hours or three hours, um, so rare, but when I do, I can sit down and just get right to work and use that image journal as kind of like a, a place to free write. Yeah. Uh, for for the, this third book, it was all sound, mm -hmm. and uh, once I knew that this voice that I was hearing wasn't necessarily my voice, right, like my quote-unquote voice. Right. Uh, I knew it was someone else's, then I knew I was off to the races uh, in terms of what I was going to write about, you know. And then, um, because I had an idea going in in terms of the book, how the book was going to, to be structured, mm -hmm. um, I knew that there was going to be more than one voice in the book, and I also knew that between the lyric and say, the performative kind of line, that was going to be my range um, when it came to writing writing the poems in, in the book, for sure. And they did just kind of develop with, I would just think to myself, I would imagine, like, what if what if Joe Cuba was a lyric poet, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, all right, cool, I can run with that. Right. And just have fun with that, that be kind of being in the imaginary. Um, a follow-up though to this question. So, Amy, you were talking about how knowing too much beforehand kind of impedes the process. Mm -hmm. But for you, you seem to be saying that you had the structure of this project you were working towards that it kind of helped you to the page. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I mean, I think so. I, I, I knew that between the stories that my mother was telling me about the Palladium and the stories that my mother was telling me about my uncle mixed with uh, poems by, say, Cornelius Eady mm -hmm. uh, on music, or say, Kevin Young, or Rita Dove about Billy Holiday. Like, I knew somewhere along that space that there was a range that I could inhabit, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the fun of it, just kind of getting in on this jam session yeah. and trying to exercise as much, I mean, you know, formality with as much freedom as I could, I think. And that's, that's, that's it just made it a different process. Because I came in, I think Kamiko recently did uh, uh, this, this lecture on uh, uh, concept books. And I, I definitely feel like this book was a kind of concept book as well. Mm -hmm. Whether it has bark or bite, that's to be determined. But yeah, it definitely, yeah, it definitely did. And, uh, and I just want to clarify too, like I'm not, like I, I, don't, I don't sit around right where other writers actually drew the cappuccino, I just have it sometimes at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I've been writing for a while, so I've been a little so you know, that might be a little bit of a twist to me. So I'm going to read this one off the cell phone. So, right. Damn, this is long too. <laughs> Because it kind of terrifies me, but 
Um, when I last visited the Philippines, I um, explored the, it's a rehabilitation center for giant clams. So I went kind of <laughs> so walking the giant clams that are about a little bit bigger than beach ball size. And so I just had in my head that I had to be in the water. I couldn't just be looking. Because I had done so much research on at aquariums and the most I could do. And then the final step was just getting there in the water. And what my um, what the biologist failed to tell me is that the, that they have a... Um, their foot, for lack of a better word, it is called their foot, which is their, their tongue, essentially. It looks like the tongue coming out. Which is like, you know, when, the, when they sense something was different in the water, they, that's how they greet you, essentially. So, walking through, it was the most surreal experience that I had. And I had, walking through this giant clam, this is Bolina, Pakistana, um, and then having a swipe of a foot come out of these clams. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't take, I can't take it. No essay is worth this. So, 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 I can think of an Afro poem yet. Yeah, it's a dangerous proposition. They can have the lyrics and get the home. I mean, they can get really sadistic. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know, you know, you know, I have to be hard work to go back home. That's one bang up after another. So, uh, but for, for this book, for sure. I did a karaoke one night. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did a karaoke. Uh, I sang um, a song called Pronostico by a band called Impacto. I killed it too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think I killed it. Yeah, right. Uh, and then I played cowbell at my uh, at my aunt's uh, living room uh, in this kind of. You know, nobody just started out out of nowhere, and I was I was getting it. Right. <laughs> so, and then that's about it. That's about the only. Thing that is, yeah. I mean, that's the only kind of living to kind of feel that moment. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, talk about the first poem you remember writing as a child. Oh, oh gosh. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine was like this whack poem called I Know. <laughs> Just was it a nephra? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. That's exactly what it was. Like, I know that there's something going on. Oh, it's awful. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> So the assignment would be like, do the acrostic of your name. So mine would be A, you know, and then all the way it was the longest acrostic poem in the class, you know, because they had to do first and last name, but I mean, it was awful. It was, um, I mean, anytime I was, you know, I'm dating myself here, anytime I could throw in rainbows, unicorns, glitter, Madonna, that was in my acrostic, so, um, yeah, it was awful. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and first the cell phone, I don't mean to just, uh, what you can do is, after, there's going to be like a, a reception, right, wine and cheese, just, you know, walk up and read your question off yourself. <laughs> uh, last question, uh, a lot of my partners, we get together, we do this, we talk about five top MCs, living or dead, right, mm -hmm. so um, if you were to make a Mount Rushmore of poetry, right, oh, who would be on your mountain, man? five faces, hmm. go. Not, I, I can be not living, we're living. living. <laughs> 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 the director of Kandima is here, so. Oh, uh, uh, gosh. I'm nervous now. I don't want to call it. You know, it's funny because I don't know how they chisel it because, right, there's no living Homer. I would like to put Homer on um, because for me, I always return back to him or her, whoever Homer was. Um, so there's that. But then right next to Homer, I would, for me, I would put Lucille. I'd put Miss Lucille there. Lucille put them. Neruda. That's three. <laughs> two, that's two. Right. Block off the block, I think would be up there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
That's that's fine between us. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>